Our next speaker is Dr. Elizabeth Phillips. She's a professor of medicine, pharmacology, and infectious diseases at Vanderbilt, where she's also um, the director of the personalized immunology program at the Oates Institute there. Um, Dr. Phillips has really contributed to one of the most important actionable pharmacogenetic findings, the association of the HLA-B5701 variant with abacavir hypersensitivity. And she's going to talk to us about uh, Vanderbilt Center for Pharmacogenomics, um, and I think focusing on uh, adverse events. So welcome, Elizabeth. So thanks so much, uh, Mary, and thanks for the opportunity to be here today uh, to talk on behalf of my uh, group. Uh, what I'm going to do this morning is give you a really broad sweep overview of our uh, P50 program, which is called Improving the Prediction of Drug Action, uh, and my co-PIs, Dan Roden and uh, Josh Denny. Um, when we think about adverse drug reactions, I think the way that we think about this is there's been a little bit of a paradigm shift. We used to think of this as type A and type B reactions being uh, predictable versus unpredictable. Uh, now we can think of these as being more off-target and on-target. Uh, the area that I focus on is off-target reactions, but both of these uh, can be genetically predictable. They can be predictable overall, and both of them can be dose-related uh, or dose-unrelated. So the burden of ADRs, as you know, is very high. There's a huge number of, of Americans and, and uh, uh, elderly globally that are now taking medications, and this is only going to increase over time, which will increase the burden of ADRs, which are cited as being the fourth to sixth cause of death overall. Um, as we know, the, the uh, uh, adverse drug reactions uh, impact also uh, individual patients, but also uh, the development of drugs overall, and this is a big uh, theme of this program is actually can we actually predict uh, ADRs early enough in drug development to uh, succumb the morbidity that this you know, affects both, uh, both pharma development uh, and patient morbidity and mortality. So the overview of our center is divided into three projects. Uh, project one led by Dan Roden. Uh, is actually uh, uh, looking at paradigms to identify patients at risk for QT prolongation. Uh, project two is our project on immunogenomics, which is understanding and preventing HLA-associated drug reactions. And then finally, project three, Josh Denny, uh, looking at precision phenomics to personalize drug therapy. And we have, uh, during the midst of actually uh, putting this application in, we had a great benefit of having Nancy Cox come and join us as the director of our new genetics institute, and she is also a part of this project and a great asset. So you'll see when I go through these projects that there's many common themes. Uh, the overriding one, though, is really that this program aims to develop strategies to predict and prevent these reactions, ideally preclinically, but at least early in the development phase of, of, of these reactions in the clinic, and to come out with translatable outcomes that will prevent morbidity to patients and drugs. And so these three projects are intertwined, um, and you'll see that some of the common themes also include using well-phenotype patients with a specific phenotype, be that uh, QT prolongation or HLA-mediated uh, toxicity. And project three intertwines with both of these by actually using the rhythmonome and the uh, HLA landscape to actually then come back and actually do dense genotyping and, and uh, phenotype prediction. So I will now start to talk about Project One, which is the project led by uh, Dan Roden, Bjorn Nomon, Chaz Hong, and Tao Yang, which is actually to identify patients in, at risk for QT prolongation. Uh, so even I can recognize this uh, bizarre rhythm, which is uh, torsade de point, and uh, it's a morphologically distinct ventricular tachycardia. And the thing to recognize about this, although drugs uh, are an actual cause of this and a prevalent cause of this. So most patients with drug-induced uh, arrhythmias and drug-induced long QT syndrome do not have a congenital reason for this. And so this has led to the overriding question, why is this? What drives patient, individual patient risk in this very common cause of sudden death? And this is actually the long QT syndrome, and you can see this demonstrated here in the, uh, in the bottom frame. So drug-induced long QT syndrome, uh, a theme amongst the drug reactions that are 
uh, being studied in, this, in, in our program is that it's a major cause of drug withdrawals and relabeling. Um, it had been uh, historically assumed, and this is now a false assumption, that most drugs that cause long QT syndrome block the rapid delayed uh, rectifier current, also known as IKR. Um, and there are many uh, drugs that actually are known to block this current that do not have equal risks, such as sodalol, uh, defedlide, uh, which, is, which commonly cause QT prolongation, and moxifloxacin, an antibiotic, which very infrequently does. Uh, I've already mentioned that genetic variation ca accounts for the minority, so there's a lot of unanswered questions as to uh, why this would occur. And the, more recently, the role for PIK3 kinase inhibition has been raised uh, when newer drugs that actually are known to inhibit PI3K kinase, such as the tyranase kinase inhibitors and the PI3K kinase inhibitors that are now being developed as anti-cancer agents, are actually found to have uh, QT prolongation associated with them, but these same drugs do not block IKR, so raising the issue of whether actually altered PI3K signaling could be actually at the front line of this. Also of interest is a drug, terfenidine, which all you'll remember was withdrawn from the market for long QT. This antihistamine also has effects on the uh, action potential duration repolarization 90%, which is reversed uh, by a downstream effector of PI3K uh, signaling. So it's really evidence that these really bad drugs, not only that were known to be IKR uh, uh, acute inhibitors, acute blockers, actually may have other mechanisms of action that really led uh, more acutely to their badness. Uh, so the overriding question, again, is can uh, drug-induced long QT syndrome be predicted? Are there ways of predicting this in the individual patient to, uh, uh, to translate into being able to predict this preclinically before drugs are actually uh, developed? Uh, now, the, the, Q, uh, um, the QT interval, of course, is electrophysiologically represented by the action potential, which is uh, just basically the depolarization, uh, repolarization uh, cycle of the uh, ventricular myocyte. But what you can see is it's complex here. You can see that there's various iron currents that are involved in this process, um, and also very complexly that the uh, PI3K signaling affects all five of these currents. So you can see uh, this, this is a very attractive hypothesis that this uh, could be playing a role. And the, the minority of QT prolonging drugs actually may work uh, actually on IKR. Uh, so PI3 kinase inhibition actually increases the uh, so, uh, sodium currents as well, and there's evidence for this both in a uh, in drug in vitro that's actually used as a PI3K inhibitor, uh, and the working assumption uh, that actually decreased IKR generates torsad to point is probably largely false. It's not this simple, and in fact, variable PI3K signaling may be the missing link. So the overarching question, again, is to what extent is this going to be applicable in the individual patient, and how is this actually studied? And this is where the uh, uh, induced pluripotent stem cells come in that actually being able to uh, uh, differentiate uh, uh, these cells into cardiomyocytes from fibroblasts in skin can now be used as a new model where uh, the potential for a drug to uh, have an effect on the action potential can actually be studied uh, in vitro uh, and, again, would lend itself to preclinical screening of drugs. <clears throat> this is uh, just showing you when, when IPSC-derived uh, cardiomyocytes are developed. This is a classic uh, phenotype of, of, of the uh, ventricular uh, myocyte in terms of this pattern, and this can be studied, for instance, over several hours where we expect uh, a drug like dofetilide to, to alter uh, um, I3K uh, 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 signaling or acutely where it might block uh, IKR. Uh, so basically, there's a, a couple of interesting uh, points here that basically these types of models could be used to identify drugs that do not cause drug-induced long QT despite blocking IDR, IKR, and drugs that are arrhythmogenic despite uh, no blocking uh, of this uh, same uh, outgoing uh, iron channel. And the other related question is, do cardiomyocytes from subjects with uh, the disease differ from those obtained from drug-tolerant individuals, either at baseline, at a resting state, or after challenge with an implicated drug, either an IKR uh, blocker or a PI3K alpha inhibitor. 
this is uh, built on a rich resource. The ability to do this study is built on a rich resource of the QT star panel study, which are uh, cases uh, and controls that uh, Dan Roden has now uh, collected that are actually uh, identifiable uh, through uh, star panel. Uh, not surprisingly, the commonest drug here is sodalol. Um, and this is really just a, a brief overview of this method encapsulating basically what I've just said, that basically it will use two extreme phenotypes, the ones that have actually had a long QT syndrome and torsades, and those that have had minimal impact with drugs uh, on their QTC, and actually study these. The original stage is actually developing these iPSC-derived cardiomyocytes and doing baseline electrophysiological outputs. So this includes actually measuring the action potential uh, duration at 90% uh, repolarization, as well as actually doing, looking at transcriptomics, looking at a two-fold change in transcriptomics between uh, uh, cases and controls. And then in AIM-3, actually going a bit further and actually challenging these cells actually with the drugs in question and seeing uh, if there's differences actually between the cases uh, and the controls. And this is the timelines for the uh, project in question uh, that you can see. And this is the team, Dan Roden's extensive team uh, involved uh, in, the, uh, in the projects. So I'm going to shift gear now and talk about project two, which is uh, the project that I'm lead leading with my uh, uh, co-investigators, uh, Simon Malal at Vanderbilt and David Coel, who's an uh, uh, infectious disease virologist, physician, scientist at the University of Washington. Uh, and I start this the same way I started uh, project one, with a severe fatal uh, reaction uh, related to a drug, except this time it's involving the skin and not the heart. And this is toxic epidermal necrolysis. This is actually a patient that was, we'd seen not so recent, not so, uh, uh, quite recently at our institution who was admitted to the Burns unit there. Uh, and she had a history when she came in of just taking vitamins and minerals, no history of taking allopurinol, but on checking with the pharmacy two weeks prior, she had in fact been prescribed allopurinol. And furthermore, uh, when we actually looked at her uh, HLA typing, she carried the classic risk allele associated with this disease, 5801. So this, unfortunately, was a preventable disease. This woman did survive, uh, uh, fortunately. And, but this disease has up to 50% mortality, and it has several types of long-term morbidity. Uh, now, this is an a, a, a article that was published now in 1941 by Francis Rackerman that was actually the... Uh, inaugural uh, leader of the allergy clinic at Massachusetts General Hospital, and he talks in this article about an increasing number of reports of queer reactions to queer substances. And this is, uh, this is what we're studying, uh, is queer reactions to queer substances, but we're hoping to make them less queer and less common uh, by the approaches that we're taking. And so what do we know about these queer immunologically mediated drug reactions? Well, we now know that most of them are restricted through class 1 or class 2 HLA alleles. And importantly, we know HLA is necessary but not sufficient for them to, uh, to develop. We know the specific model by which some drugs but not all drugs interact with HLA. And we know that many of these drugs have a long-lasting immunity, meaning that if you get TNA at age, TEN at age 20, at age 60, you could get the same reaction if exposed to the same drug. Uh, HLA has uh, clinical implications for pharmacogenomic screening. And what we know with now the uh, several drugs that have been associated uh, with class 1 alleles, for instance, is that although these are very high odds ratio associations, that they differ significantly in terms of their predictability and the number needed to test, if you will, to prevent one case, meaning that this can range from a 13 for abacavir, which is now widely translated into clinical practice, to almost 14,000 for an, a common anti-staphylococcal used in the UK, meaning it's going to be feasible for abacavir, but not for flucoxacillin. Uh, now, for abacavir, the uh, crystal structure of abacavir bound to uh, peptide and HLA was actually solved, um, and the actual mechanism uh, that abacavir interacts with the MHC, in other words, HLA B5701, is actually known. It's actually known to alter the repertoire of uh, peptides that bind within that an uh, antigen binding cleft, and by doing this, it essentially creates a novel HLA allele that is now uh, recognized by the immune system as a, as a foreign process and creates a hypersensitivity syndrome. Uh, what we don't know for many other reactions, uh, in, and including some issues with abacavir, is what are their, the other models, what maintains the long-lasting immunity, 
uh, why are such uh, some traditionally delayed and T-cell mediated reactions occurring so quickly within hours sometimes of first exposure? Uh, and lastly, can we actually predict the drugs and uh, HLA alleles preclinically that are most likely to cause these severe diseases? Uh, this is an example of an abacavir patch test showing the long-lasting immunity uh, in the uh, skin and actually ex vivo responses that show the same. Uh, we don't know uh, if all drugs behave like abacavir, if they actually bind within the antigen binding cleft and alter the repertoire of peptides that are recognized by T cells. And probably it doesn't really matter in terms of the translational outputs we're looking at. If we're looking to develop more rapid screening tests, all we need to be able to do is actually define ex vivo and in vitro immune signatures and see if those are altered in the presence of drug compared to patients that are tolerating the drug. Uh, this is an example of the uh, T-cell receptor uh, clonotype that occurs in patients that actually have carbamazepine-associated uh, SJSTN, all of which have B1502. And you can see that there is uh, an obvious representation of this uh, uh, V-beta-12 uh, uh, clonotype uh, that comes from blister fluid that you actually don't see in controls. And interestingly, we can see that this has uh, significant homology between a herpes simplex virus 2 TCR clonotype. So this w raises the question, could it be that the reason why these are such bad reactions that occur in the skin, in the case of SJSTN, that actually there's resident uh, memory T cells in the skin that actually, when a drug is introduced, that there's actually a cross-reactive response due to a distant reaction due to herpes simplex uh, and the self-peptide and drug that are introduced by the introduction of the drug. And this is an example of this CDR3, which is actually very close between HSV2 and the carbamazepine uh, uh, V-beta-12 clonotype. So what we're really saying with this model, then, this is proposing a model of heterologous immunity. And so if we can think about the original restrictive event occurring years, decades ago, so if, if Dan Roden got uh, HSV1 infection when he was kissed by his grandmother uh, at age one, and that occurred here, and then at age five, when he started school, he got chicken pox. And then in his teenage and adult years, well, we'll just leave that one, we'll say. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but he would have made a uh, robust T cell, memory T cell response to those viruses. Uh, but then what happens uh, if decades later he's exposed to, say, an antibiotic or uh, an anticonvulsant, uh, and actually the uh, TCR, if there's a cross-reactive T-cell response that's made that actually, which can occur, unfortunately, and randomly, and unfortunately does not occur that commonly where the actual drug uh, bound to endogenous peptide, there's a cross-reactive response uh, bound to HLA with the initial response that occurred that was also restricted, we think, by the same HLA allele, so a double restriction process uh, years earlier. And this would actually be uh, one of the prime theories that we're proposing, for instance, for drug-induced SJS uh, TEN. Uh, so specific aims for project one are to, uh, to identify T cell receptors used by T cells, again, in drugs, uh, uh, drug HSR, but not tolerant individuals carrying the same HLA allele, uh, to define those antiviral T cells, again, in the same populations. Uh, and then to define the cross-recognizing uh, uh, T cells. And, and the translation from this is actually, if this could be detected, which we'd, we'd expect it to be detected because there's been a previous viral, uh, uh, virologic memory that we would expect to be able to detect potentially uh, a specific T cell receptor clonotype in the blood of patients before they're actually exposed to drug. Um, and so the actual project itself looks at drug exposure in two different populations, much the same as Project 1, um, and uh, tests at the very end this heterologous immunity model that I uh, described to you. And this is the rather complex pathway that would hope to, at the end of it, come up with the discovery of uh, potential markers that could be used in addition to HLA typing uh, in patients before they're actually exposed to drug. Um, and this is our Project 2 core team uh, at, uh, at all at Vanderbilt, except for David Coel and his postdoc, like in uh, Jing. Um, and this is our larger drug hypersensitivity uh, team acknowledging uh, the support of several people, including patients and families that are contributing these samples, uh, which is an extensive commitment. 
Um, so now I will go on to project three to de uh, describe uh, the work of Josh Denny and his uh, uh, co-investigators, uh, Y. Kui y. Cosman Bejan on precision phenomics to personalized drug therapy. Uh, so project three, again, has specific aims that are among the broad theme of the uh, IPODA P P50 uh, and uh, the, uh, the difference in this uh, uh, project in, is that it's not using uh, biological specimens from patients, but it's using dense uh, data from the electronic health record that's linked to the BioView DNA Biobank, which is a rich resource at Vanderbilt, to uh, look at uh, dense genotyping and FIWAS in AIM-1, to look at repurposing medications in AIM-2, and to look at uh, more dense predictors of ADRs across all medications in AIM-3. And so this just uh, uh, summarizes the uh, aims and the intersection between those. Uh, and so as many of you know, that the, uh, there's very rich uh, electronic health record-based research at Vanderbilt. There's a synthetic derivative, which is de-identified and continuously updated and is now uh, in excess of uh, 2.4 uh, million uh, patients. Uh, there's also uh, the BioView, which is paired with uh, DNA, which I'm sure now is well above 215,000 samples that have uh, paired DNA. Uh, and then thanks to, uh, to Nancy Cox's arrival, we're expecting this also to increase rapidly, but there's dense GWAS level genotypes and exome chick data in a large proportion now of those actually that are uh, linked with uh, DNA. Uh, and so the uh, uh, premise of, of this program, the, the history is that there was a, it was a rich resource of GWAS data uh, and then uh, Josh has led really phenome-wide association studies to define uh, with what phenotype a genetic variant is, uh, is, is associated with, and this has become really a rich, uh, rich resource at Vanderbilt. Um, and uh, what, uh, what we need really to do these unbiased uh, association studies is a large cohort of patients that have the genotype data and, and well-delineated uh, uh, diagnoses uh, this is uh, an example of where the uh, FIWAS data was, was replicate, replicated across all NHGRI GWAS catalog SNPs, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and basically the replication associations uh, with the FIWAS as well as a uh, discovery arm. Uh, there's also been uh, uh, many publications associated with this and many phenotypes that have now been looked, like, looked at. Uh, important to this is actually the definition of the FIWAS phenotypes, which uh, uh, involves uh, the designation of a specific fee code, which actually is, uh, is built off usually some sort of ICD-9 or, or 10 code, but then there's actually a secondary uh, 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 conditions that actually add specificity to this, and these are now uh, publicly uh, available and published, and actually now in the setting, I think, of, of, of ICD-10 are also being redone. Uh, in terms of uh, the project it's, itself, uh, AIM-1 is building a densely genotyped longitudinal uh, cohort uh, and particularly performing uh, FIWAS against all existing pharmacogenomic variants, but also new genes and variants that will be identified uh, from projects 1 and 2 within the Rhythmonome and HLA variants. Uh, there's been a lot of work imputing HLA type from HLA genotyping, which is uh, is now uh, complete, and uh, this has uh, shown actually very high accuracy uh, across different imputation programs. Um, and this is an example of the uh, HLA FIWAS, which was uh, led uh, within Josh's group by Jason Carnes and others that really showed that uh, actually just in a, in a single study that many diseases associated with specific HLA uh, class uh, one and two types could actually be replicated, uh, and, uh, and there were new discoveries within this group as well. Uh, so AIM-2 is actually leveraging the data that's uh, uh, identified in AIM-1 to repurpose drugs and predict, predict side effects. Uh, and this is an example of a made-up drug with a made-up gene, but with the current indications in rheumatoid arthritis. And using these types of approaches, they can actually, actually be uh, used to actually validate actually uh, discovery, but then go back and actually find new targets that can then be used to uh, repurpose drugs and, and identify other side effects, misunderstood side effects associated with these drugs. And this is an example uh, where FIWAS was used to assess drug indications and where uh, the target uh, TYK2, which is a Tyranese kinase target within the Jack family, uh, was originally thought to be a risk predictor for rheumatoid arthritis. But in this study, there were two particular uh, TYK 
genes that were actually found to protect against rheumatoid arthritis, suggesting that these would be viable targets to be studied uh, as therapeutic targets for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, AIM-3 is actually more densely predicting adverse drug reactions, and this is actually an aim that is well underway, and there's many published trials already, actually, that Josh and his group have put out there. Uh, this was an example of the replication of the clopidogrel data where clopidogrel adverse events associated with CYP2C19 star 3 could then be replicated within the electronic health record uh, in patients actually who had had ischemic events or who that were coming in for elective cardiac procedures. And you can see that the carriers uh, were at significant risk uh, uh, for uh, future uh, morbidity and recurrent events. Uh, there's also been new discovery in terms of new genes associated with events such as ACE inhibitor uh, type uh, cough associated with this KCNIP4 uh, variant. And you can think that this might be used in a way that if this was actually translated into clinical practice, these patients could be identified and put on ARB uh, or angiotensin receptor blockers instead of ACE. Uh, so there's been uh, replications and there's been new discoveries as summarized here. Uh, in terms of the methods for the, uh, for, uh, the third aim of Project 3, uh, it's really to build a database of medications linked to these coded uh, side effects, uh, and this builds already off a very rich resource. Uh, and uh, the second uh, sub-aim is to extract provider-documented drug ADRs from narrative clinical documents, and then thirdly, to evaluate these against no phar pharmacogenes and target drug, drug target genes. And as mentioned, this will build heavily into into the first two projects in terms of the rhythmonome and, uh, and, and HLA. So in terms of outcomes, uh, it would be looking at databases of coded indications, uh, understanding the extreme pleiotropy of disease, again, for pharmacogenes uh, within uh, the this, this space of ADMI, uh, uh, rhythmonome, and HLA, uh, and actually to develop new data that suggests other variants that are contributing to ADRs. Uh, and uh, last but not least, to develop really a data sharing resource where these tools and results could be shared broadly. Uh, uh, and this is just uh, to finish up, to uh, acknowledge the uh, vast uh, team of uh, collaborators and investigators involved uh, with this work. So thank you. Questions? I will uh, start. So if someone's at Vanderbilt and has a terrible skin reaction, what, what do you do? Do you guys have a reaction team uh, equipped with cameras? Um, do, you know, have you implemented just, anything special? Yeah, or? I mean, in terms of, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, what we do is we have, we have a very, I mean, it's a, a very multidisciplinary approach to having uh, uh, a, a good collaboration and working relationship with surgeons and dermatologists and the people that are really at the front line of looking at this disease. And so, for instance, a uh, research nurse in the Burns unit may call uh, our research nurse to, to spear off the process. If it is on the weekend, which it often unfortunately yeah. is, um, then we have a, uh, a, a set of laboratory technicians actually that are on call for the weekend. They vary, they sort of rotate, and then therefore we can always uh, extract PBMCs from blister fluid and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and cells and get samples from patients acutely because we think there may be different immune signatures acutely than in the recovery phase of the disease that are important. And it also allows us to do other procedures like working with skin and other things. So we've, we've, we've got a fairly good, good setup. And I should say that I personally, although I see these patients clinically in follow-up, I'm not so involved in the acute management of them. Yeah, it's, it's hard because there's a million different specialties involved in the primary management, yeah. right? And then we need to have another group of specialists look at those reactions. So, I mean, I, I think that it's having, it's having broad engagement. I mean, I've been, I've been called by a plastic surgeon in the OR saying, I'm just about to lance someone's blisters. Do you want any? And, you know, so they're, they're fairly collaborative. Uh, Elizabeth, can you hear me? Yes. Very nice talk. Um, yeah, so I have a couple of uh, probably very naive questions. Um, the first is, um, in the HLA low psi, you know, we, we read it and all, all of us in pharmacogenomics follow it, but those of us who are not in it don't completely understand it, of course. So your, your talk is always very helpful for me. But in the, in the HLA like 5, 7, 
any one of those deleterious sort of deleterious or risk alleles. Um, are people homozygous for those, and does that matter? Um, or, I mean, I've never heard of that. I've never heard of a gene dose. You either have it or you don't. Yeah, so, I mean, HLA is, is inherited in a co-dominant way, so we'll, we will get one uh, sort of allele, like, of, of all of the six from our father and mother, ideally. Sometimes that doesn't go well, and we find interesting things in family studies that we don't want to know, but, uh, mm -hmm. but that's generally the way it is. But, you, I mean, you raise an interesting question, and when we first started looking at abacavir, we, we wondered whether disease would, A, be more prevalent, and B, more severe if patients were homozygous yes. for B5701. So in theory, that can happen if, if each parent carries 5701, and then the offspring could actually be 5701 homozygous. Interestingly, for abacavir, it doesn't seem to make a difference. But for other diseases, there does seem to be a clear gene dose effect. And Dapsone hypersensitivity is an example, very nice New England paper a few years ago, B1301, if patients were actually homozygous, they had a, a significantly higher risk of getting dapsone hypersensitivity than if they just carried one copy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice talk. I, I have a question about your long QT uh, syndrome and propensity for, uh, for torsades. Do, do you understand how um, changes in electrolytes, and I'm thinking particularly of, of low calcium, which prolongs QT, how that um, uh, changes the risk for torsades. Do you want to answer that, Dan? I think with Dan Roden in the room, I... <laughs> Hypocalcemia is, uh, prolongs the QT interval, and the mythology in the electrophysiology world is that it doesn't really predispose to to long QT-related arrhythmias. It does something funny to the QT. That said, there's really not a very good data set. Um, why hypocalcemia does that is actually not well known. Hypokalemia also prolongs the QT. That's pretty well understood, I think, and there's a, there's a variety of mechanisms that have been invoked, one of which is, one or more of which is probably right. So I don't have a great answer, but that's as good an answer as I can give you. Thanks. All right, thank you very much, Elizabeth.